While studying the hadiths, I came across numerous instances that showed an incredible degree of fear exhibited by the companions vis-à-vis -vis their mentor Muhammad. Will you explain? Our listeners should keep in mind that the pagan Arabs of Medina especially, the Aus and Khazraj, called the Ansar for supporting Muhammad, were blood-related to the Judaized Arabs through intermarriages and alliances such as the Bani Nadir, Bani Qaynuqa, and Bani Qurayza. They were very highly influenced by stories that the Judaized Arabs used to recite to them about the coming of their Messiah, who would lead them to victory over their enemies and would restore to them the kingdom of Judah. On the whole, the Jews and later the Judaized Arabs exerted a great influence upon the pagan Arabs since, firstly, they were well versed in economics and could hence manage the economy of those regions, and secondly, compared to the pagan Arabs, they were lettered as the people of the book and consequently possessed higher learning than the Arabs who were quite illiterate. They used to narrate tales and talk about many very interesting and entertaining biblical stories with the pagan Arabs, hence gaining their considerable respect. While the absolute majority of the pagan Arabs could neither read or nor write, most of the Jews and Judaized Arabs were familiar with reading and writing. The faith of the Jews exerted such a strong influence that a group of the Quraysh tribe, namely Banu Qunana, embraced Judaism without coercion. The Aus and Khazraj were thus very susceptible to the idea of the coming of such a leader. After he had insinuated himself among the ignorant, illiterate, gullible and superstitious pagan Arabs of Medina, Muhammad, as the alleged messenger of Allah, played upon their weaknesses to such an extent that they actually believed that he was the Arabian version of the Messiah who could intercede with Allah into sending any of them who would contradict him to Jahannam, hell, but those who believed and obeyed him to eternal sensual and sexual pleasures in paradise. Even the fearless and ruthless Umar ibn al-Khattab was in terror of him. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 5.494 narrated by Zayd bin Aslam. My father said, Allah's apostle was proceeding at night on one of his journeys and Umar ibn al-Khattab was going along with him. Umar ibn al-Khattab asked him about something, but Allah's apostle did not answer him. Umar asked him again, but he did not answer him. He asked him again for the third time, but he did not answer him. On that, Umar bin Khattab addressed himself, saying, May your mother be bereaved of you, O Umar, for you have asked Allah's apostle thrice, yet he has not answered you. Umar added, Then I made my camel run fast and took it in front of the other Muslims, as I was afraid that something might be revealed in my connection. Sahih al-Bukhari Hadith 7.115 narrated by Ibn Umar. During the lifetime of the Prophet, we used to avoid chatting leisurely and freely with our wives, lest some divine inspiration might be revealed concerning us. But when the Prophet had died, we started chatting leisurely and freely with them. The most remarkable attributes of the Ahadith, in general, is that they portray and reveal Muhammad's character and deeds in an extremely negative manner, not befitting any decent human being let alone an alleged prophet. It should never be a surprise to any thinking person as to why the followers of Muhammad all over the world exhibit such incredible and unbridled hatred of all those who do not follow their creed. They are, after all, only emulating and following Muhammad's last will and testament that they should slavishly obey without questioning both the Quran and his Sunnah. Sahih al-Bukhari Hadith 7.18, narrated by Ursa. The Prophet asked Abu Bakr for Aisha's hand in marriage. Abu Bakr said, But I am your brother. The Prophet said, You are my brother in Allah's religion and his book. But she, Aisha, is lawful for me to marry. Ladies and gentlemen, so-called believers and unbelievers, Abu Bakr was so shocked at Muhammad's proposal to marry the child Aisha of only six years of age while Muhammad was 50 years old, that he told him, but I am your brother, meaning that it should not be permissible, as if it were depraved or incestuous. The single word, but, lacking in Arabic, speaks volumes about Abu Bakr's state of shock and disbelief 
regarding Muhammad's unseemly request, which of course turned out to be an unchallengeable demand. Even a pagan such as Abu Bakr found it inappropriate, if not offensive, for a 50 years old man to have sexual intercourse with a totally immature and innocent six-year-old female child. His shock alone is evidence and speaks volumes that what Muhammad was demanding was actually against the social norms of even the pagans of 1400 years ago. We shall, of course, receive the usual comments by Muhammadans and their apologists denying the importance of the word but, so as to downplay or overlook the enormity of Muhammad's immorality. Unfortunately, Abu Bakr, like all the other gullible followers of Muhammad, actually believed that he was the messenger of Allah and was totally petrified to go against his wishes or demands. Muhammad was able to fulfill each and every one of his fantasies by introducing an alleged divine verse to back him up. In this manner, with Allah always and very conveniently at his beck and call, Muhammad was able to justify all his actions, deeds, misdeeds, lust, hatreds, anger and desires without any mere mortals to challenge him. The Messenger of Allah. Al-Tirmidhi Hadith 194, narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah. Amr ibn Khattab brought to Allah's Messenger a copy of the Torah and said, Allah's Messenger, this is a copy of the Torah. He, Allah's Messenger, kept quiet. And he, Umar, began to read it. The color of the face of Allah's Messenger underwent a change, whereupon Abu Bakr said, Would that your mother mourn you? Don't you see the face of Allah's Messenger? Omar saw the face of Allah's Messenger and said, I seek refuge from Allah, from the wrath of Allah and the wrath of His Messenger. We are all well pleased with Allah as Lord, with Islam as religion, and with Muhammad as Prophet. Whereupon Allah's Messenger said, By him in whose hand is the life of Muhammad, even if Moses were to appear before you, and you were to follow him, leaving me aside, you would certainly stray into error. For if Moses were alive now, and he found my prophetical ministry, he would have definitely followed me. Ladies and gentlemen, please be always aware that the hadiths are the foundational texts of Muhammad and Islam that presumably contain Muhammad's own words and deeds over a 23-year period, while the Quran being dominant in Muhammad's cult belief system. In studying the scripts, one should remember that many of his words that are understood apply not only to a specific people or for a specific time or event. As we have very clearly demonstrated in many of our chapters, and based entirely upon the Quran and its explanations in the Hadith, that as Muhammad's circumstances changed, his words, teachings, commands, and attitudes also changed. Thus, as situations progressed over time, Muhammad's words and teachings morphed to accommodate them. This is demonstrated by the fact that Allah also changed his mind in concert with Muhammad's needs through the great number of abrogating and abrogated verses wherein he overturned or overruled earlier alleged revelations. No matter how much the followers of Muhammad try to prove our chapters wrong or misleading, the records in Arabic of the Muhammadan exegetes that we refer to that are available to all our audience for independent verification show that our veracity is unassailable. In the final analysis, we have conclusively demonstrated that Allah, Gabriel and Satan are actually manifestations of one and the same persona, Muhammad himself.